internet businesses where we set up internet um, businesses by ourselves as well as reporting companies and I was on the board, I was serving on the board of companies uh, which brought me also to most Boston, Massachusetts where I was um, working as a CEO for a company which we bought um, and uh, worked there for a while. Um, this always was very international teams. Um, connected with uh, people like Peter Senge and Otto Schammer from the Sloan School of MIT, as well as Robert Keegan, who developed this um, psychology model of um, maturity um, in, um, in Harvard. And I tried to learn from them and put that into consideration of my work, um, which brought me then at the end to Google in Dublin, where I was uh, heading the Scandinavian and Benelux area. And uh, after a while there, I decided to quit and to uh, found our nonprofit association, which is Wisdom Together, which is in, in Germany, in Munich, registered nonprofit association, but it's working all over the world with conferences, retreats, workshops. And I'm working as an executive coach and interim manager as well, and bring that um, notion of purpose, meaning, um, and business experience together. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Alfred. So we're going to jump over to Jan Delgado. Um, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself. So Jan Delgado, I'm running a group called Hyperion. I was born in Morocco, became a complete French product where I started to uh, trade options on the floor during five years, then bonds, then I accepted an expat contract for Gibraltar to start private banking with a bank called Indo Suez at that time. So I've been there, I've been in Gibraltar for the last 20 years. I joined uh, during 10 years Credit Suisse. I used to run the private banking part there. And for the last um, a bit less than 10 years, we, we created a group together with uh, Raymond Kirsch and, and, and other people such as Frederic Oana. Uh, Vicente Mancheno and Stephen, who's uh, in the audience, Stephen Lloyd Morgan. And we basically are doing wealth management, family office, and now real estate and culture. Okay, so uh, Jose Luis, go ahead. Okay, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to take part on this uh, webinar. My CV is shorter than the, the ones of my, of my colleagues. I'm, I'm Spanish, I was born in Madrid. I'm a journalist as, as background. I have been working for the media for more than 20 years. I came to Gibraltar and in, to the region 15 years ago. And uh, from seven years ago, I joined Jan Delgado and his fantastic team for, first of all, for the Gibraltar World Music Festival and then for BrightMed, which is a platform of culture and other things like talks, seminars, film festival, etc. Okay, so throughout this discussion, I'm going to um, give a, a uh, sort of Q and A between you all, um, and we're going to try and share um, some key takeaways at the end of the discussion to just. Um, underline the what it means to build a new and meaningful economy from your different perspectives so i'm going to start with you alfred you've mentioned google um and that's very interesting i'm part of also a franchise that has been powered by google for startups so one of the questions i wanted to ask you 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 had um some control over the top so sorry, you engaged with top management team um, and their financial targets, etc. Um, but your sort of efforts were more about how does this align with what the world and what people need. So tell us about your role and how it evolved in the projects you were able to develop during your time with Google. So <clears throat> I joined Google in Dublin, the European headquarter. Um, and uh, they asked me to take over um, the, the leadership for the Scandinavian and the Benelux territories for their online marketing activities. It was more or less marketing and sales. And um, and um, when I came when I came to Google, we had a um, and I 
I was joining the team, mm, there was a kind of red flag in all hands on deck. And I said, what's happening? And they said, we have only 17% growth. And I said, guys, if other areas and other companies would have 17% growth, they would have champagne on the tables. And they said, no, we need 20% year over year plus. So I was questioning that for a while because um, what we did is more or less pushing companies into growth um, without asking them whether this is really meaningful what they do. Of course, they should decide by themselves. But the question for me was, shall we push companies into growth through marketing activities and then creating a situation in the world where we are observing a lot of energy costs, where we uh, have a cultural divide, where we have a lot of depression um, seeing in the world? Or shall we, you know, where Google originally started from, saying don't be evil, thinking about what does it mean and how shall we align our business interests with our social attempt to make the world a better place, what Google always say they do. So um, I had a lot of conversations with top management people, how we can do that and how we can build on this. And the question was, yeah, you know, Alfred, we need that because we are a listed company and we need to um, to take the advice from the analysts and and I said I don't think that's true we are the biggest listed private owned company in the world probably at that time because Sergey and Larry had about 56 or 57 percent by themselves so I said why why do you think you should hear what the analysts say and not doing the other way around and trying to educate a market into a certain different direction, which is helpful for the market, for our environment, for our social um, um, social beliefs, and um, and taking this social responsibility. And, uh, and they said, "Yeah, but you know, recruiting is a hard thing to do because we we cannot pay the people so much that we need actually to have some stock options and have their variety there, and uh, you know, and for that we need this growth." But that's a trap we are going in because I don't think, and we had other areas where we spoke about later on, but, um, but I think there are, um, there are um, companies who grow in this world, but not maybe to an extent of 20% plus. Um, very healthy companies, but also more focusing on purpose and meaning and focusing how we, can we contribute to our society and not only to our shareholders. And that is something which I think the current situation is, um, is more or less um, um, asking us to think about. And I see that on the political level as well as on the business level and organizational level in, in several countries of this world, that there is a new rethinking of, um, shall we really go for this um, Wall Street kind of strategy of, um, of extremely high growth expectation? Or can we be a little bit more flexible and see what is the first thing why we are doing the things? And then we are trying to organize our business accordingly, um, which also can be very healthy, as I said. And there are examples, maybe we come later to this, um, of companies who do that, also in that size. Was that answering the question, Denise, or? <laughs> no, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. So um, I'm going to go over to Jan so he can tell us a little bit more. Um, you've explained you have a background in finance and banking investments, but you're currently the um, man CEO and managing partner of Hyperion Group. Um, tell us about the group and about your role there. Well, the group is made of uh, 13 people between Gibraltar and uh, London. We have not less than uh, 10 nationalities, I think, and the uh, same number of languages spoken, which clearly makes a very diverse team. Uh, and managing a diverse team is not the same as managing a, uh, a team in Switzerland, for example, but it's full of incredible joy. We started, in fact, this group uh, based on uh, simply relation with clients. We came, most of us, from Credit Suisse in Gibraltar. And uh, we wanted to create a, a company in wealth management and family office. But frankly, even the business models were, was dead already. 
everything was dead. It was post-2008. So we didn't know if we were doing the right thing. But what came as an intuition uh, was that the need for individuals to have a proper relation and continuity and being able to speak to them about many other things than just money and money and money was the, was the trigger. And uh, they accepted to join us. And here we are, we, we started uh, we studied hyper. So it's pretty much about relation. And when you, when you manage the money of, of some clients, you in a way read as well uh, their life because uh, it's made of good and bad things, accident in life as well. And you start to understand that. So we, we are three partners, equally uh, shareholders. Um, and we have three main activities now. One is wealth management, which became slowly family office. Because when we are in private bank, private bank today, what's very difficult is to be able to offer all type of services to the client. You have to be uh, segmented and work on certain region only or certain products only. So you can be a great specialist, but sometimes the client and the relation needs a bit, a bit more naturally. And um, within the time we transformed uh, uh, this, uh, this wealth management model, which was dead from day one into family office. And our definition of it was, can we front every actors around uh, the, the client, lawyers, bankers, uh, any type of advisors, real estate agent, tax advisors, and digest all of this and give a form of peace of mind by reporting all our work to the client. So that works very well uh, as a family office, which we transformed in 2015. And it, it helped us to have a very transparent and a new model like applying a flat fee, for example, which was not the, the rule in private banking. Then, uh, then we, the family office, obviously all clients had, when you know, they wake up in the morning and they have other wishes and they ask you things. So we are like GPs, you know, we, we, we are not specialists. So we will search and research to find a solution to their new wishes. And one of the main uh, asset uh, class that they really wanted to go to was obviously real estate. And as a consequence, we created, I mean, a few years later, a real group in real estate involving a fund, a development company, and even a real estate agency with a license to pay. So that's, that's how the group is. Obviously, the third leg of the group is the culture, but I will let probably Jose Luis uh, develop this part, which is called the Bright Med. The whole vision at the beginning was, uh, can we offer a, a nice qualitative event uh, or series of events made in Gibraltar once for all? Why not us? Everybody else shines. Is there any culture in Gibraltar? Obviously, there is a lot, but how do you look at it? So that's, that's the group, really. And my role, I believe, uh, it's, it's, it's always questionable to to see what is the role of a CEO, uh, the CEO of last few years, the CEO of today and the CEO of tomorrow. I believe that I'm just facilitating the work of everyone else in the, in the team. They are very experienced people anyway, very strong people around, around me. So that makes my life easier, really. Um, managing as well all this diversity and make sure the communication goes. Coming from me, who doesn't speak a perfect English, it was a bigger <laughs> challenge even. <laughs> Uh, we, we communicate a lot. We, we manage to, to reach a lot of goals. And funnily enough, we still are not capable of making one joke that will be understood by everyone else. So that's the only, that's the only, so we have to transcend ourselves to, to higher uh, visions and, and purpose in life, probably. And really that makes the whole, uh, that makes the whole story very enjoyable. Um, we're not just looking for maximizing profits all the time and, uh, and putting high targets because this is not, uh, we, we, we are not really a startup. Uh, the, 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 the age, the average age is higher than the, <laughs> the population and, uh, and we are not individual startups. But uh, I think it's you, uh, Alfred, who told me once, uh, Confucius used to say, the goal is the journey. And that's, that's exactly what we're living at Hyperion to the extent that our slogan, and we took like one year of meetings to try to come and assess our own values, our slogan today is beyond the money, the journey starts here. You probably saw it in some ads here and there, but we really believe in this, really believe in this. So 
I'm going to tell you the key takeaway for me from this part of the question is enjoy what you do. Um, it makes the job a lot easier and engage with the different personalities and and actors in your in your teams. So these are important factors which I think drive success of the group. But we're going to go to Jose Luis because um, I was really keen to involve him because mainly the perspective of somebody who is so close um, to Gibraltar but yet sees it through different eyes. Um, as a journalist by profession, having worked for some of the leading media outlets in Spain, like Cope and Adia, what was your perception of Gibraltar as a place of business before you started working here? Well, um, Gibraltar has always been seen in Madrid as a controversial site. After the time I that I have been living in the region, as I told you, more than 15 years now, um, I have been able to verify that this vision is fundamentally based on a deep ignorance, not only of the place, but also the region that surrounds Gibraltar. From Madrid, and I would even say that from beyond the Campo de Gibraltar, which is the region around uh, Gibraltar, one has a very wrong vision of what this part of the world is. And that vision is highly influenced by the political dispute between Spain and the UK over Gibraltar. Nothing to do with the reality as we face every day uh, here in the region. Once you have settled in the area, you can see that Gibraltar is a very special place. A place where cultures, religions, nationalities, languages, as uh, Jan said, uh, uh, Hyperion is an example about this diversity, uh, they are very different from each other, no? But at the same time, they fit perfectly in the reduced space of five square kilometers. And precisely, precisely, I think that this meeting point of different ways of seeing the world gives Gibraltar such a broad vision of transformation and creation of new business opportunities. The lack of space for the installation of large industries, large, as, such as those precisely located in, on the other side of the border, no? in Spain. You have Tepsa, you have Atherinox. And the fact that Gibraltar is a peninsula surrounded by sea and only connected to the, con con to the continent through a country which there is a political dispute has also, has also made the Gibraltarians, that's my point of view, okay, have been enterprising when establishing themselves as an economic reference point. And of course, without forgetting no, that the tax advantages offered by the government of Gibraltar to the companies is always a good reason for attracting uh, opportunities and offer a dynamic economy. So thank you very much, Jose Luis. Um, we're going to come back to you, Alfred. Um, you've mentioned Wisdom Together and your work with uh, this nonprofit organization. And you already started to address three challenges, which were environment, society, and within ourselves. So how do you feel these challenges have contributed to where we find ourselves today? Well, let me go back to, uh, to the summarize what you, uh, summary what you did um, um, to what Jan and Jose just said. I think uh, Thoreau, um, the American philosopher of the 19th century, um, he actually did a good uh, saying. He was saying, do what you love and love what you do. And I think, that brings us to the point where we say, think about where we are now and what is happening now. We're always trying to download and projecting that in the future, what experience we had in the past. And to, by doing that, we are not able to really innovate. And coming back to your current question, I think but that is important that we can develop this kind of ability to innovate by letting go and letting come um, is possible and is needed more than ever. So I believe if you're going back to our uh, um, mechanistic view, which brought us to the point where we are right now, it's, um, it's like we had this from Hobbes, this uh, homo economicus, who thought that humans are only actually um, into economics. Nowadays, dataism came in. Yohari uh, wrote a lot of books about this. 
the new religion data, um, combined with the homo economicus and combined with the notion of singularity, what Ray Kurzweil and the Singularity University in California are trying to promote, is um, merging biology with technology, which means you have an homo economicus who are, have a chip in his or her brain um, filled with data, and then they believe that they will make the world a better place by doing so. I believe that the opposite is the case because every big innovation which we have seen, and there are a lot of studies from Stanford and Harvard about this with Nobel Prize winners, is that it is not about data and it is not about our rational mind. It's actually our access to intuition. And if we are connected with our intuition, we can, um, we can create something which is not um, have not been in your mind beforehand. And that is a notion where we have to come to. We are seeing a world right now where we are consuming about one and a half or two worlds per year, if you cut it down of the resources. And um, so we have an environmental problem, even though everything of these discussions is covered right now by COVID-19. But I think that is the situation which we are still in. We do have a social divide where we see that um, I think eight people in this world um, have access to more financial assets um, than the bottom 50% of our world population. And we have a high depression rate, especially uh, for young people, increasingly going up. So what can we do with this situation? And I think COVID is helping us a little bit. We see that uh, politicians um, who have never thought about that before are thinking about whether the globalization in terms of how we structured our supply chain is the right way to do it. Or if we should rather look a little bit more on the regional aspect, how we can take advantage of our regional potential of the wealth which we are creating in our environment, really in our closer environment, and then connecting these hubs with each other on a global space, and that is globalization, but not you know, trying to manage everything from a global perspective down to a local, um, local entity. And that is what we are, what we are doing with Wisdom Together, uh, where we are in our conferences. We were in Russia, in Costa Rica, in Oslo, in Stockholm, in Munich, so um, in, in Lit uh, Latvia. So we were quite around the world and, and we um, are bringing in scientists, um, business people, spiritual leaders, and artists to come together and think about how do we want to live together? How do we want to work together? How do we come to innovations? And in this regard, uh, Jan and I came together and, um, and Jan was Brightnet and his festivals in Gibraltar. We had actually a kind of similar approach to this as what he was saying was, uh, um, was his company um, that he said, it's not necessarily thinking, focusing on how to make more money. It's more about thinking you know, what are we going to do with that money? And how can we create wealth for everybody in this world? Or, you know, it doesn't mean that everybody should stay at the same level because we are different and we should appreciate the difference. But to focus on what is the reason why we're making this money and really taking, it, uh, taking the time to speak to the people um, and to develop something which is needed for this area. And I think, um, I've been to Gibraltar once, I was invited, and I was grateful that I had the opportunity to speak there. And I think it's a wonderful spot where we could really think about what can we do there, because it's so small that it's not really important for the world, but it's important if we do something there um, that nobody really cares and said, oh yeah, that's too small. But if something new innovative comes up, it can have an effect around the world. And you can see that in different countries. I was once in Bhutan where I worked together with people of the Gross National Happiness Center there. We were in Costa Rica where we did some things with the government there and some executives where we thought small countries can have a, uh, can have a big effect actually on the worldwide community um, and the work which we did there had an impact on the development of the sustainable development goals. So 
it triggers down. You know, don't underestimate what you can do as a single person, as a small region. And that is what we're trying to stimulate. That is something which we're trying to um, explore together with our clients. When I'm doing coaching together with people, I'm coaching them and saying, what is your potential? What do you really want? And how can we involve all the stakeholders and shareholders together to make that happen to the benefit for all? That's wonderful. I think healthy open lines of communication is really what stands out in, in your um, answer there as well. So over to you, Jan. Um, I have a question, but we also have a, in the Q&A box a couple a comment and a question from the same person. So I'm going to let you reply to that first because I think um, it's, it's fun to engage with the people who are participating. We're going to try and answer all the questions in the Q&A as well as the questions that we prepared, but um, if, if time allows. So the first uh, comment was proverbs work better across cultures than jokes. So I guess that one was for you. Um, but also later on, we'll talk a bit more about BrightMed and the different um, branches of what you've done with BrightMed. So I thought this was, would be a, an interesting question to ask you. Uh, what is the role of education in creating a new economy? Are we geared up for it? Do we have a clear set of skills that new leaders will need to have? So there you go. Okay. Uh, we found out that, uh, I want to pick up on Alfred first what, and what sure. he said. Uh, the title of this conversation is Building a Meaningful Economy. We're not trying to fool you at all. We are, we are really focusing on meaning first of all. Uh, we have been, uh, it took us ourselves, I'm, I'm referring to Jose Luis as well, a lot of time to understand, uh, maybe I was not mature enough to understand that if I don't understand the culture, there will be no business. And, uh, and then, then the world opened up to, to us. Um, you cannot do business. You cannot have a meaningful uh, uh, economy. You cannot do an economy if you don't understand. And as, as clearly uh, uh, Alfred said, you are not trying to work meaningfully together. It's impossible. That's our opinion. And we stand by this all the time in every single little move. Our little Hyperion in the little Gibraltar moves, this is what we try to apply. As you said, it's an incredible lab, Gibraltar, where you can achieve things. But you have to move. You cannot just stay there. In terms of proverbs or jokes, I can argue, uh, the culture actually and the music, we always ask ourselves, what are the best languages to reach the souls? You know, we didn't discover it. We just did things and we found out that that was the one. And what was it? The music, for example. Uh, some others would say that the smells are going to the soul very quickly, the higher and the quickest, uh, the quickest uh, but the, here we're taking too much risks. So <laughs> music was definitely uh, uh, one of the best, la best language. So that's for the pro proverb. Education, I was going to touch uh, uh, upon this after. Um, uh, when it comes to Gibraltar in particular, we, I think we hope, I hope that we all agree that without education, just forget everything. Uh, um, I, I used to live in the country, traveled in other countries. And I have to, to, to thank Europe in general for having offered me the possibility to study in good conditions. I didn't have the money to go and study in university. So I studied in France and it was for free. I owe France everything about education, which helped me to climb some ladders in, 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 in social and economy in general. So um, when it comes to Gibraltar and education and the system, it's not just education, it's a, a real ecosystem that we have to put in place. We have a university now. I think we have globally good public schools, that's clear. But we, we tend to send our kids to UK for universities with a great uh, support financially. And we have uh, a new university which has been created, what, four, four years now? Maybe Carlos Martin somewhere in the chat could, could confirm this. It's not an up and running in the sense that it doesn't offer full diploma and full cycles yet to be able to retain our own. Um, one of the ideas and the moves in education is we have been with Jose Luis trying to influence, influence a lot of the charitable trust or philanthropic trust to push their different initiatives. 
but these are little moves and uh, there's still a need for a very global uh, approach to it and it's definitely not enough in Gibraltar. The uni is there, it's a marvelous place. If you don't know it, please go and visit. But we don't have yet, unfortunately, the, the maturity because it's simply very, very young. Education for us at all levels could be, uh, could be improved in Gibraltar. And the first steps would be, for example, uh, when, we, when it comes to the festival or our company, we try to onboard people and young kids to come and do a few days in our company. Many others do it, but that's the first link they can have with uh, real businesses. They spend few few days. Uh, Stephen Lo uh, Holland Morgan, for example, is uh, usually in charge of uh, taking them around with Gaynor Oliveira from our, our, our team and making sure that they have tasted every single activity. The danger in our group is that sometimes everybody knows about Hyperion, but nobody knows what Hyperion is doing. It's too much. <laughs> so we want these kids to come and really embrace all the different activities and they come out with hopefully a higher uh, a vision of what they would like to do. In the Brightmade as well has a, a fully dedicated, uh, and that's how we met as well, Alfred, uh, uh, event once a year called the Brightmed Talks. And in the room at Incess Hall, we have 300 students, it's packed. Actually, there's not enough seats. People are even sitting on the floor. And we're bringing inspi in, in, inspiring thinkers from all over the world in, the, in different, uh, um, uh, in different uh, domains. It could be an artist, a thinker, a politician, uh, 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 a student itself who, who already moved uh, seriously. So we have, we're trying at our small level, but we are not Gibraltar. We are just a small company in Gibraltar. So we just hope that this is inspires the neighbor and the, and the competitor to try to do even more there. That's great. I did have another question for you a little bit more about what um, Hyperion has evolved um, with the launch of Just Real Estate, but we're going to hang on with that because I'm sure we can explore that a little bit later because we have more questions coming in and I wanted to talk to Jose Luis a little bit. Um, I'm just going to add to that that clearly education is a lifelong process. So the times we live in now when everything is moving and changing so quickly, um, it's possible that the system that we have in place is not always the best prepared for it. But it also comes down to initiatives of, you know, bright med talks to learn from and absorb what else is, is happening and these very important conversations. So over to Jose Luis, um, from your profession and um, a little bit of your experience. You've been doing the, the PR for Hyperion. So tell us a little bit about the processes for good communication within a business um, and how you have um, developed that. Well, as Jan explained now at the beginning of this uh, webinar, Hyperion is a company with a very innovative philosophy with activities that go from pure finance to culture, no? as uh, we have seen now with BrightMet and the, and the Gibraltar World Music Festival. And after more than 20 years in the media, working for a company like this one uh, has been and continues to be a very interesting and enriching project for me. Not only from a professional point of view, but also from a personal one. No? The company's matters to communicate are always variable. Suddenly, you may be talking about a new, new real estate project, as we are doing now, for example, in the heart of Gibraltar. And suddenly, you may be talking about uh, and the artist for the festival. Uh, suddenly, not for this year. We hope to do something uh, at the end of, uh, before the end of the year, but why not 2021, no? And that makes uh, both the audience you are addressing and the design of the message that you have to launch always different. So you have to think about uh, how to communicate these different things, no? Um, one good thing is that Hyperion already has a well-earned reputation in Gibraltar and is known as a company with innovative and successful projects. So it's, it makes everything a bit easier no, for, for us. On whether, whether communication is important or not for a company, nowadays, I think that precisely we are living uh, a days where 
communication is vital for the companies you know, and for the future of a company. It is clear you know, that uh, the important thing is to keep the company afloat in times of crisis. But precisely, if we do not make ourselves known among our, our potential customers, we will not be able to work on, overcome. No? So in communication, I think it's a key factor for the companies. Fantastic. Thank you, Jose Luis. Um, I'm just going to quickly look through the questions as I address Alfred again. Uh, I was going to ask you a little bit about staying connected and technology. And do you see there is now an opportunity to, for technology companies to better support innovation and creativity to bring more value to society? But there is also a question about how do you see the foresee the future of work in terms of staff working from home and its impact on your business or on business in general. So I thought maybe we could combine an answer for that question too from one of the participants. Dean, thank you very much for your question. So um, I believe that technology um, has always uh, played a role in, um, in the evolution of societies and, ever, and development, the personal development of people as well. And um, as Jose just mentioned, communication um, is a key part of that. And uh, what we do right now is communication through the web and having the opportunity to bring people together without traveling um, and um, letting other people participate in this kind of conversation from wherever they live. And I saw that people are from Munich here, there are people from Gibraltar, from Spain, from UK. So you can see that, um, that there is an opportunity of bringing people together. I think it should be an addition always, because I, I don't think um, technology or this kind of calls can substitute the personal meetings and um, but they can augment it and they can add value to it and that is something we have to explore um, for me it wasn't really um, something new when covid came and we said we have to work from home because i was always very remote um, active in the world when i was working for Lycos in boston um, my my shareholders were were in uh, seoul so i had to communicate with these folks and I had companies where I was responsible for in Japan and my my family was living in Munich so I was quite quite remotely working with them handling time difference time zones and technology helped a lot by, by doing so um, also of course the search functions and um, and technology like what you have with building business plans and, uh, and scrumming sessions and bringing people into certain questions, expert in it, is uh, possible these days. And there are a lot of tools which are out there, not only from the big ones, but more and more are coming also from the grassroots, which I found very exciting that people can work wherever they are coming together. And uh, it's about, you know, bringing their new ideas into the world and that is possible. One thing which is uh, which I found always um, important, and I'm speaking to some social impact investment funds about it, and they're saying a lot of our investments are went dust because you know um, the people were not able to deliver what they think they could deliver, and they were asking why is that happening? And from my perspective, it's a question of maturity. It's a question of personal development level. And that is something where we, where we developed a kind of a one year um, support in this with, uh, with workshop sessions or retreat sessions, uh, three in this year. We have coaches who are supporting these people um, on their personal questions. It's not about business acumen and it's not about you know, the financials. It's more about how can you bring your innovation and your idea adequately into the world, mean, how can we use the circumstances where we are in? And that could be inside a bigger organization. We did that for Google once as well, where we uh, developed how can an innovative idea can bubble up from the grassroots up to the top in, in Mountain View, uh, but also um, with new ideas of the startup scene. How can, we, how can we encourage people to look into themselves and then develop what wants come out of them? 
And, and that innovation in combination with purpose and meaning is something which really becomes valuable for a lot of people. And then it becomes also financially substantial. So then it can, and then profit will also follow. But, um, and that is something we are working on to support companies in thinking along those lines. And uh, recently, we, are, uh, we started a campaign uh, with Japanese folks, um, the head of the innovation network in Japan, Kono Noboru, who has developed with a philosopher there the concept of bar, which is a concept where you're coming together and you forget all what you know before in trying to bring in design thinking methodologies as well as meditation techniques, really to think about what might come out. And out of this, new ideas can, can emerge. And they are working together quite closely with the government, with Sony, with Fujitsu, with big organizations, as well as with small companies. And I think this kind of initiatives uh, following Einstein's sentence, you cannot solve a problem with the same kind of thinking which have, uh, which have brought us to the problem. So to really change that mindset and attitude is very important. And that's why I think what Jan is doing there with BrightNet, for instance, in bringing artists in, in combining that with traditional thinking of, you know, um, investment and, and bringing that together could be, from my perspective, something which a lot of people were, will ask for in the future and could be something which would be well placed in, in Gibraltar, I, I can imagine. Thank you, Alfred. Um, we're going to come over to you, Jan. I'm getting so many questions, which means that people are finding the discussion very interesting. Um, you, we touched before we started the discussion a little bit about the new process for Hyperion in, within the team to work from home. I'd like you to touch upon that a little, um, but also just to go back to the question um, that Dean was asking, but also um, touch upon maybe how you have communicated with your clients and your teams when everything has, all hell has broken loose um, around your business model. But I think that it's time that we kind of go towards the part about why you were so inclined to involve different cultures um, and the arts within your passion for what you do. So maybe if you can just give us a little bit of an overview on all those points, which I know is a lot, but I'm sure you can cover it. <laughs> well, you, you have like 10, 10 questions in one. Okay, <laughs> why not? Uh, uh, first of all- uh, looks like a journalist. Yes. First of all, uh, Hyper, like any, many others, basically just suffered during the first days of the lockdown because the financial markets have gone down by 30% overnight. First, first of all, what do we do? The first thing uh, to check really if we had the right value and the right people and so on, and, we, and I'm, I'm pleased to say that we have them, we have very experienced people in, at Hyperion, and I'm very happy about this, obviously. What did we do? First of all, we had a choice to isolate ourselves and say, it's a storm, let it pass, everything will be fine. It doesn't work like that, uh, not only in financial markets, but with the clients. You must call the clients. It seems like a very, very simple and basic, uh, basic advice, but we, it's not our first crisis. And we saw uh, for all the pride bankers that are in the audience, or, or others that if you don't call your client, you don't have the final solution, that's clear. You have to call the client and say, look, this is what's happening. I'm working on it, okay? We are in the same boat and we're gonna to try to save everything. So some clients really lost 20% overnight in our portfolio. Maybe this is not uh, a great marketing to speak about it, but I'm telling you, we have done this. The good news is that they are at minus five today in, on average, okay? But where did it come? We have a process. We have people, our CIO and others, we were on the market every single day trying to see what we can do. And it came through, again, small moves and different touches on each portfolio and on each asset classes. For example, we are very much bond driven and invested in, in the allocation of our clients. And you could see that some names are going to go bankrupt and they went bankrupt. But at the same time, you have a market which goes down by 30% and many bonds of very 
good companies have suffered as well in terms of price. So there was an opportunity for, for the show to take some bonds, which actually are today at plus 20% just on the price. And it was, it was just a panic effect. But some others will never come back and they are dead forever. So the daily trading and not just waiting behind an asset allocation, traditional from private banking, very rigid, which could be a, a, a disaster during that time. Uh, we basically moved on the two, on the two, two directions, to really trying to go into the trading more. So that's what we did in terms of uh, portfolios. And today, uh, well, we promised our clients that we will try to go back to flat uh, performance this year, which is a big, big, uh, uh, a big achievement if we manage to. I don't think so. I think the markets are very optimistic. And, they, 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 and the, near the, 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 the very immediate future until sometimes in 2021, and we don't know when, the market is going to do swings again and swings again. And uh, to be fair, it's not new, it's just accelerated. The COVID is accelerating many, many other topics. We're talking about communication. Well, if you were not knowing Zoom, now everybody knows Zoom. So COVID, uh, Zoom should thank, uh, should thank COVID big time. And obviously Slack and Skype and WhatsApp and uh, uh, Microsoft uh, other, and Google, etc. All the, all the, so that's for the markets and Hyperion and how we basically navigate in the storm. Uh, but really the outcome is you must maintain the relation with your client. You have to report, you have to speak, not every day. Funny enough, it's some clients just don't want to hear about it. During a month, there's a client who didn't want to answer his calls. He doesn't want to know. Well, the client is the king, so <laughs> we, we respect it, but we never failed on the re reporting. So that's for the, this part. Uh, on the real estate, maybe, the first thing we did, uh, and the team was excellent, you know, Gibraltar came with some measures and uh, proposed immediately some businesses to um, to some so the, the landlords actually to waive 50% of the of the rent for April, May, and June for the businesses which are going to suffer without really knowing, but they defined a certain number of sectors. We didn't wait. We saw some competitors really playing a tricky game, and this is not the future, believe me, because they're going to lose their tenants. We went to our tenants with obviously a big uh, hit on our income, and we told them. We are going to apply it before you even ask for it. And guess what? We developed, we developed amazing partnership with them since then. And now we can ask them for tutorials and comments saying how, how good we are, blah, blah, blah. But it takes a lot of courage to take the phone and talk, and talk to them and say, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to hide and, and wait, okay? Uh, and anyway, the government did it very well. They basically said, you do it or we tax you 50% on the whole income anyway. So you had no choice. Still someone to play. There is no room to play here. The staff, our staff didn't play. They are professionals, they just went for it. We didn't play in front of a client trying to overdo our marketing of I don't know what. There are realities. You have an opportunity, and that's what I hear from Alfred, to engage even more and show what you are paid for, really. And you're doing this extra mile in the middle of the crisis. Uh, we want, first of all, our boat to be safe, every member in the boat, staff and clients, to be safe. So we need to maintain the, the strength of Hyperion and carry on navigating. Of course, it's a storm. It will pass. Maybe not the 15th of June, maybe not the 1st of July, maybe not before the end of the year, but we have to, to aim for, for more. And this collaboration between the, the, this obvious collaboration between the client the staff, the CEO, and the, and the different stakeholders is absolutely important. One detail, we, uh, someone came with this idea of, why don't we make a list of uh, 10, 20 people of, of your network, and not talking about just the business network, but your family as well, during the COVID uh, lockdown, and call them, ask how are they? How are, how are you just that? I think this is what I did with Alfred, and here we are, by the way. Uh, I just said, okay, who, who means some, something for me? And I made a list, a long list, and I called the people and I sent an email and said, look, how are you? Actually, I, I care. I want to know. I really want to know. 
I didn't do it with thinking we're going to do a discussion now and uh, and it's going to be great and so no and and here we are so we did collaborate that way because even if our cultures are very different we approach each other on this field again and we and we communicate simply so this is always a very a very big uh, a big a big story here um on the remote work etc because i'm trying to remember all your points uh, we don't have the we don't have the perfect solution yet at Hyphen. We ask everyone to decide as well to all the members of the staff to participate, uh, and uh, everyone came with an idea. So the, the moment you open the Pandora box, you receive well, one million uh, uh, opinion. But we we thought to debate this was important, and as a result, for the, I'm not talking about the very short term, uh, meaning July August, which we have a, like a crisis plan to come back to the office. You can imagine cleaning everything and making sure we have the social dis distancing and so on. Uh, but I'm talking here about, yes, it's very, very important that my colleague, part of what became my family, our team, uh, can pretend having one day of respite or work, they decide once a week and come back more energized with actually more productive that's the truth uh, to the to the to the um, to the work with even more strategic thinking as i said so we will see if it works to be fair uh, because it depends very much on all of us and how much we respect but i'm very confident i'm even uh, I, i'm actually really wanting to go out because i i'm i'm dreaming about having an offsite with all of them somewhere in uh, in a different place, a, a form of retreat of maybe one day. We always dream about doing it in Tarifa. I think it's going to be now the real moment to do it and have their conclusions, their philosophy, and their uh, outcome of this crisis. Because this is as well what we feed on and, and inspire us. It's not just what we just think, you know. Our intuition, or our, our moves are fed by this collaboration all the time. What are the other points? Well, we were going to talk a little bit about the arts and the culture and why it's important to you to engage with that, even though your business is completely different. So, so culture. Yes. Okay. Um, culture. Um, I think, uh, funnily enough, what the whole thing started when I had real strong personal issues. My world was collapsing around me 10 years ago, sickness around, divorce, blah, 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 without going into details. And uh, it was just finished. So it was a crisis. It was not just a virus. It was like everything was done, finished. And even the work had no importance. Uh, um, okay, so, and funnily enough, things came like, the music, and I am not a musician, so that's why I think everybody can do anything they want. I am not a musician, I have no idea about solfege, and I have no idea about how to read any partitions. This is incredible. And uh, I started with a little page on Facebook, which was a joke, and five people were following me very nicely. Maybe they were scared of saying no. And uh, <laughs> after that, it became a few thousand, and uh, I received calls from very inspiring people from all over the world saying, I followed you have a page on this type of music. I'm from New York, I'm a singer. I'm from Madrid, I'm a manager. I'm from Macedonia, I'm this and that. So, wow, wow, what's happening here? The whole world is contained in, 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 uh, in, in one page. What's, what's going on? So they inspired me to make a concert. We, then we took it from there and then uh, as you say in Spanish, uh, sobre la marcha, la marcha. So as as we were working on on the festival, uh, we discovered that of course this language was just amazing. So we brought um, on stage. We didn't think we could be able to do that, uh, really, I mean, none of us. But uh, imagine uh, uh, Indians and uh, and uh, Chinese together on stage singing. Imagine Greeks and Turks, Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, Chinese and uh, and the Japanese together. It's uh, every year, every year, every year. These people came, and uh, we were demonstrating every day that everything is possible. 
We were driven as well when we created the Bright Med by this large amount of information from the Mediterranean and the Middle East and the, and the Asia Minor of Islamist groups trying to put bombs here and beheading uh, all this. And we want to say, no, this is not what I experienced. I was living, I was born in a Muslim country as a Jew with a French and European culture, and I never had a problem. So I couldn't accept one second that this was the reality. It was obviously amplified by, by the media and, and, and these groups who were doing the, these bad things were using and manipulating the communication fantastically. They were communicating fantastically, making sure that you can be very, very scared. So we wanted to demonstrate at our level only from ourselves that we could put all these people together and demonstrate every day that it is possible and all this blah, blah is just a, a, a political game basically or, or wish to, to dominate a certain region or, or maybe some oil fields, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we're not that uh, naive about it, but culture became uh, the possibility to move forward on this. And very quickly, we realized that when in Gibraltar, people in the past, in fact, 10 years ago, were not going out necessarily for a concert that easily or for a conference or for an exhibition. Today, things have changed a lot, thank God. But that's why we decided to bet on the kids. Uh, and we gave uh, every year this possibility to the kids to come and join. And they are incredible, full of energy, inspiring, inspiring you more than you can inspire them, really. And we offered them all these profiles to talk and inspire them because Gibraltar is a place uh, where the individuals have actually at least two sounds, English and Spanish, okay? And the geography is quite obvious. It's a carrefour, it's a crossroad. You have two seas, Atlantic and the Mediterranean. So the symbols are huge. So they are already open. You just have to feed them as much as you can. Um, if we have like 10 famous Gibraltarians all over the world today, we make, we guarantee you that in the next 10 years, you're going to have a multiple of this, if not 100, 1,000 very, very famous Gibraltarians. And you know that amongst the 10 that I'm referring to, uh, these people have made an incredible career all over the world and are capable of anything. When you have this man that you probably know or not for the audience, who's always behind the Pope, uh, whispering things in his ear, and he's actually Gibraltar, and he's the main uh, translator to the, to the Pope. Who knows about this, really? How much marketing do we make about this? When we have a Christian hook, and I don't want to deny the other ones, as, 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 a, as an artist, painter, the, who wins the UK uh, uh, Sky Art contest and sells now at I don't know how much each, each painting, same story. These people, uh, you know, they had to fight for, to eat even 10 years ago. And I remember a story, uh, everybody comes to the office and see, oh, eight portraits of Christian Hook, of the staff. Okay, fine. We, we didn't pay the price uh, we should pay today because we cannot afford it. But at that time, Christian Hook and us, we had to exchange 400 pounds to be able to live, really. And that's how it works. And then we, it inspired us to even identify emerging artists of Gibraltar, and we offered all our building, uh, office building, for an exhibition. Uh, so I'm sure you all have, again, it's not about talking about how much we're great and what we have done, but uh, you have a lot of potential. Have you shared it with others? Have you spoken about it? Did you realize that everything is around you? It's not just about money. I would be a billionaire, maybe wearing an amazing watch and uh, driving red sport car, or whatever. Not interested at all. Uh, we, in this journey, really try to enrich every day and every day. And you can ask Jose Luis and the others, uh, it's ups and downs. There are days where we really want to give up on all of this because we don't have the support or the financial support, etc. But here we are, um, you see, you, you're patient enough to let me speak a lot and I can take it out. <laughs> so I, here we are for the culture. This is um, actually one of the comments from uh, Gaina, who's part of the team in Hyperion, is that it's, she can vouch for the fact that 
you know, you are willing to listen, you're willing to engage, and you're willing to transition with your team rather than make the decisions, which uh, um, she's commented in the chat, that you are not just talking the talk, but Jose Luis and Jan also um, do the walking as well with the team. So that's a, a really nice addition. I'm just conscious that we've hit the one hour mark and I think that we need to try and answer some more of the questions and at the same time wrap up with, with some of the key um, issues that we have you know, discussed today in terms of you know, building a, a new and meaningful economy and how you feel that this can be achieved in, in some key points. So I'm just going to go over to Jose Luis with um, one of the questions about uh, political commitment and how the private sector can make sure that their initiatives find a way through into political um, implementation. Uh, look, um, what uh, Hyperion is doing with BrightNet could be an example for the politicians, no? How the private sector invest and support uh, culture and education should be an example for the for the governments, not uh, Gibraltar one, all of them. Um, you can see, for example, that culture in Spain is suffering because of the lockdown and because it has been out of the help from the, fine, from the government since the beginning. And if you don't have culture in your society, it's a risk, it's a total risk and uh, they should uh, focus now that everything is going well or at least a bit better they should focus on invest again in culture and education okay it's good that the companies uh, are have to maintain their business or the companies but you need to plant the seed on, on our kids because they are going to be the our future and if they don't have this part of the society, which is the culture, and which is the education, uh, uh, which world are we going to have? Are, are we going to have in the next few years? You know, is everything uh, as Jan said, for example, uh, are they going to want to drive a red Porsche or a red uh, car, but without values? I don't think so. It's not what we want. What I want for my daughter. I want my daughter, my daughter, for example, to think that there are all the things that money, there is family, there is a lot of walls in the books that she's reading now that is where she, could, uh, she can travel with the books. And that's what we should do. And what's, that's what the government should do. And if companies such as Hyperion or the sponsors that have been with Brightnet and the Gibraltar, Gibraltar World Music Festival from the beginning, continues doing it, governments like the Gibraltar one will see it's a, it's a good thing to do and they will carry on. So I think that to answer the question a bit, little bit more directly, just adding in a little bit of my experience is that sometimes you just have to take your own initiative first. Um, if you really believe that this is an initiative that is going to bring value um, and that is a way to eventually get support from private sector sponsorship, supporters, governments um, in a more long term view. So I'm going to just let Alfred give us some of his closing um, key points about uh, building a meaningful new economy today so that we can um, start to wrap up the session. Um, I'm sure people are getting hungry and they need to switch off at some point. So um, please, Alfred, just give us some of your key points. Um, thank you for giving me the chance to speak here after um, this um, um, interesting words about culture, because in Stanford Business School, um, the professors are uh, leading the economic courses with uh, the same culture eat strategy for breakfast and the one or the other of you have, might have heard that, which means that culture is important on several levels, as Jose mentioned, on a society level, but also on a company level. And uh, to combine this um, means, and that is one of the key points, 
that um, culture is happening inside of you, inside of you as a human. So if you know who you are and being authentic, what you want to achieve, what you want to do in life, that is a way how you can support or how you can create a new experience for culture. So, um, and then everything else will come apart. So you're inviting people and creating a context um, either inside of a company, inside of an organization, inside of a society, where you're inviting people with an interesting topic, with an interesting approach, which is touching people not only in their hearts, but also in their heads, but also in their hearts, um, to combine the rational, our rational mind with our intuition or our heart. And if you can do that, then things will be successful and then I believe that we probably have the chance to solve a lot of the problems which we are solving right now. We will see in the upcoming six or 12 months probably a lot of um, destructions in, um, in our social life, in our economical life. Um, and I tend to try to see that as an opportunity, as an opportunity to think about what does it mean for our culture? How do we want to live together? What can I give? What, how shall we uh, collaborate with each other? And how shall we create communities supporting each other in companies, in organizations, in individuals, and what kind of culture is important to create such an environment, which then from there, we can build a new society in which we want to live in. And I see this kind of thoughts are here and there around the world everywhere. And that is what makes me um, grateful that I can live in this extremely interesting times. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Alfred. And thank you for joining us because it really is refreshing to be able to connect with people from all over uh, with such different perspectives. Um, I'm going to go over back to Jan. And um, there's a few questions here that I'm going to just try and get you to cover um, in your closing. Uh, key points also. Some of them are about the evolving of the business model. Uh, some of is uh, future music events and how you feel they, they're going to be post the virus. Um, and obviously your key views on the building of the meaningful new economy. On the, on the music side, obviously, uh, we were told that there would be no support for 2020, which we understand very well, and, uh, and uh, it's the case everywhere else. I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased to see that Germany yesterday, so an article that they're investing 50 billion euros <laughs> into uh, companies involved in culture, so I'm so impressed, and they are leading probably uh, this, new, this new way, and they understood, hopefully. Uh, so what do we do? Simply during the, the lockdown, we did not, but we organized a lot of online uh, discussions in very specific gender of music, like the Sephardic music. We've done already some. We have another one uh, uh, next Thursday. And uh, it helped us to, and I can, okay, it's not a scoop, but why not? The theme of the festival of this year was supposed to be called, uh, uh, it was supposed to be a word that we hear in the streets of Gibraltar all the time, it's, it's actually kushame. No, normally people in Gibraltar, when you walk down the streets, mainly uh, when you know when people cross the border, you hear people and you see them touching each other all the time, say kushame, kushame. In fact, it is escuchame, which means listen to me. And we thought it would be wonderful to use this for the festival as a theme. And we spell it K-U-S-H-A-M-E. And Tito Vallejo, who's a specialist of the Yanito, which is the local dialect, uh, for the region of Gibraltar, has accepted the spelling. He actually, why not one day put it in the new di dictionary of Yanito? What, what a privilege at our level, you know? So, of course, if we were in the States on the English dictionary or in England, it would be different, but, but we're very happy about this. Uh, so we're organizing uh, uh, actually from uh, the 2nd of June, every Tuesday or Thursday, depending on, on the week, uh, a Kushame session meaning we are actually allowed now to call any artist of the world, anywhere, and if they say yes, they can come for an interview of 30 minutes and you can access them and, and question, make questions and answers. 
So we're starting this uh, online, which means we're going to actually gather more contents. For example, all our contents for the last uh, eight, nine years have been given to GBC and the Gibraltar Cultural Services. And every day since the lockdown, they do project at uh, 2 p.m. something about the Bright Med Talks or the concerts and so on. So why? Because in fact, because we are a modest uh, uh, festival and Madonna on a daily basis, we could control our contracts and get uh, better rights than the others and be able to show you wonderful artists from all over the world, from Mali to Turkey, from India to Japan, etc. etc. So we, th that's on the, um, on the music and the future. We are confident that we will do the festival next year. And it's going to be called Kushame because everything is aligned and, and, and ready. And Kushame is wonderful because uh, it's a pretext to, sh to, to bring to you all kinds of music in one. All, more, more than just a specialized gender. And if you don't mind, I would like to say just a few words about Gibraltar uh, for the economy. So I'm looking at it from our... Uh, perspective in Gibraltar. Uh, Gibraltar has managed, I, I can say so far, fantastically the crisis. And uh, thank God we don't have that many cases, although the unlocking will probably show cases, but it's so well managed uh, by, by the government. Uh, I just hope this will be an opportunity to really assess our own values and really start to move. There's an urgency on this. I'm, I'm very impressed by the decisions about closing some roads uh, to make the environment and the traffic, you know, environment better, the traffic less. And, uh, well, okay, the problem is that, you know, sometimes uh, they have the impression that they need to make announcing effects uh, very, very quickly and they have to come back to their, their, uh, their announce, announcement and, and check and consult with the real, uh, about the real damages possible. But we have really an opportunity because Gibraltar is, has all the ingredients. You have heart in Gibraltar. People have a big heart. They have big hospitality, uh, 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 not only knowledge, but, but um, value and, and will to, to welcome other people. Imagine, for example, I'm just dropping an idea, but we can, you can adapt this to so many other things. We have been shining for many reasons. We were you, an old offshore platform uh, with a bad reputation and the work which has been done for the last 25 years is very big to place us into an onshore, clean, I insist, very clean place in terms of uh, uh, financial uh, assets. Uh, uh, so we have the possibility now to shine in many, many other things. We spoke about culture, that's one thing. Imagine if we were offering such uh, crazy, uh, amazing tax-friendly packages to, I don't know, doctors and specialists and, and open a research center here. We cannot grow tomato on the rock, that's quite clear. We cannot have uh, the best wine of the world. We have only a few square meters. We have a lot of tunnels. We don't really know what to do there, to grow cannabis or not. Uh, these are opportunistic moves. It paid a lot for Gibraltar uh, so far, but I think a much longer term vision can bring us something amazing. So bringing specialists and offering this and the possibility to research in Gibraltar why not in 10 years having the most brilliant research center in Gibraltar? It can be adapted to any other type of uh, corporation or, or domain. It can be the hub for philanthropy in Europe. It can be et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we can multiply the soil. But there's an urgency to, as well, when we have uh, such an amazing online uh, gaming um, sector, e-money, uh, blockchain, and so on, you still filling your tax reporting by hand and you have to put it in an envelope and go to the tax office and put it in a mailbox and you have no receipt, you have no idea if you're gonna lose it or not. You still have to fill a form in writing for obtaining a license with the OFT, the Office of Fair Trading. You still, for the ETB, the employment, you still need to fill forms in writing. This is not possible. We are the kings of the blockchain and at the same time we are, <laughs> We have this paper. Uh, so these are obvious digital moves we can do uh, because we will attract even more, uh, more company who will be delighted to live in Gibraltar. The a place with the rule of law where people have heart. And I insist on the heart because I spent so, many so much time in hospitals for, 
for me or others, and I saw people uh, being numbers in, in great hospitals, uh, either in France, Spain, uh, UK, uh, Switzerland, or, or, or Morocco, to give an idea. But in Gibraltar, you're not a number. They do care. It's incredible, and that's, that cures 50% of the disease, believe me. So this is an ingredient of Gibraltar. And of course, all these tax-friendly packages where you come to us, you have to pay tax, but a bit less than elsewhere, is a, a fantastic, as Jose was mentioned before, a fantastic possibility to, to create your new business and, and, and take it even to Europe or, or to a stock market, which we have a lot of examples. So that's not in a nutshell, unfortunately, the type of things we, we, we can say. Maybe you want to say something about what we discussed the last few weeks with a lot of anxiety and energy and fights. Uh, well, I always have a lot to say too, but I, I tend to prefer to let the people who are in the discussion to take the lead. Um, I will give some closing thoughts too uh, to the conversation, but I think just on the note of uh, local talent for such a small place and also um, on the ability we have to, to be agile and to communicate um, quickly. Um, I think there is another example of a local microbiologist who came up with the COVID-19 testing machine that could provide results in five minutes. And we were provided in Gibraltar with this machine because Dr. Nick Cortes, who is working in the UK in a lab, just happens to be Gibraltarian. And, and that is clearly amazing on a population of 30,000 people. Um, so we have to really push uh, more for people who are talented to shine through, as you mentioned before. But just to close, I want to give Jose Luis an opportunity to, to give us his um, closing thoughts on, on how we should progress in society and how we can do better. Well, I cannot do it better than my colleagues, Alfred and Jan. I cannot say anything better than what they have said. The only thing I could uh, do is to remind, remember that if we want a better world post-virus and we shut down the culture, it will not be a better world. That was, that's my main key. Okay. You're on mute, Denise. So there has been a few comments about a second session as we are now finishing off this session. Um, again, just to say thank you so much for, for your insights and for sharing professional, personal stories with us today. I definitely think that this could become a series of seminars um, as we give people the opportunity to, to hear and engage with, with new ways of thinking. Um, my key takeaways from this discussion will be um, make people feel good about themselves. They become so much more productive if you listen um, to their needs. And also um, to uh, offer to give before you expect anything is also something giving back to your community, giving back to, to different initiatives is also something that will at this moment um, need to be retained as we move forward. So that's uh, my small contribution from what I've heard today. Um, just uh, thanking everybody for joining. Thank you for everybody who has supported us in, in organizing this se seminar. And we just look forward to the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much and see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.